Thank you, Seth, and good morning. It's good to be back with you all. I'm grateful for uh, Jeff standing in for me last week. I had a touch of bronchitis, and I'm feeling fine, but my voice is probably a little weak, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> we had to put off the lesson that we had spoken about uh, two weeks ago, and that is a lesson that we're going to look at this morning. So we're taking a break from the book of Galatians. We'll resume next week. But because of this change in schedule, we are going to have a little lesson on the church and why we do what we do. So I'm going to look at a few texts, but the one text that, uh, that I will read this morning is Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we gathered together <clears throat> to break bread, and that's an important expression. I'll come back to it in the lesson, but that's really a reference to the Lord's Supper. Gathered together to break bread. Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room when we were gathered together. And there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him. And after embracing him, he said, do not be troubled for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time in it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. In one of his sermons, Charles Spurgeon said that God looks on the gospel and the work of the gospel as the grandest of his works, which means he considers the church his grandest work. Spurgeon said that it has been the chief subject of God's thoughts and acts from all eternity. Church, if it's his grandest of works, is not our work. It's God's work. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Paul called it the pillar and support of the truth. Christ died for the church. The apostles labored for it. Paul crossed continents to establish churches, and in doing so, he suffered all kinds of hardships. Hunger, exposure to heat, exposure to cold, beatings, shipwrecks, and daily, he said, he was concerned for all the churches. It follows then that we should be concerned about the church, God's grandest work, but to have a wise concern, we need to know about it. We need to understand how the, the, the church is to function and what our responsibilities in the church are. So that's what we'll be looking at this morning, and we're doing this as I noted in the, uh, the, at the beginning of the reading of the scriptures that we're doing that because of a change in schedule. We mentioned that two weeks ago. Uh, the evening meeting when we have historically celebrated the, the Lord's Supper for almost 60 years is being moved to the morning. As some of you have not attended that evening meeting, and I know, at least I think, you would like some explanation for our practice, which I have to say is one of the main reasons that the men who established this church back in, I think, March of 1962 did so for that meeting. And uh, tells us historically for us it's important, but I think from Scripture as we study, we'll see that it's very important. And very simply, 
why we do this is we attempt to follow the practice of the early church and the principles of the New Testament. Well, I say that, you would like that demonstrated, I think, from Scripture. And so this morning we're going to look at a couple of passages from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and then Acts chapter 20, and then one from 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. But the best place to begin is at the beginning, when the church was established, which was on the day of Pentecost, one of the great feast days of Israel. That day is the birthday of the church. It was supernatural. It was a work of the Holy Spirit. It's recorded in Acts chapter 2. I'll just summarize the event and, and draw your attention to some specific points of importance for our study. Before ascending to heaven, the resurrected Lord told the apostles that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they would be his witnesses and his witnesses not only in Jerusalem but to the remotest parts of the earth. Chapter 2 begins with the apostles and others gathered in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit came. Verse 2, And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. That word tongues is always used in the New Testament of a known language. And so it would be used of Aramaic and Greek and Latin. The city was filled with pilgrims from all over the world, east and west, from Persia to Rome. And and they heard these people speaking in their language, various languages, but they're all hearing the message. It was a miracle, and verse 11 says they were speaking of miracles. They were speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And so these people, this audience, is thousands of people that were gathered there in the temple in Jerusalem heard of God's great miracles, and they were witnessing one when these uneducated people spoke foreign languages. Well, then Peter spoke and explained things, and he gave a sermon. This is the first sermon of the church, and it was bold. I think that's significant because only a month or so earlier, weeks earlier, Peter had cowered he had denied the Lord three times, even wilted in his vaunted courage that he had spoken of earlier that evening before a little slave girl. But now he's a different man. The Holy Spirit has come upon him. And he spoke of Christ and he spoke of his crucifixion boldly before all of these people and spoke of his resurrection. We find in verse 23 and 24, this, the heart of this great sermon, he he charged the audience with complicity in the Lord's death. This man delivered up over the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross. And through the sermon, verse 37 states, they were pierced to the heart and asked Peter and the apostles, what shall we do? And Peter told them what to do. Repent. Repent. And they did. About 3,000, according to verse 41. And they were baptized that day. That's how the church began. Through the preaching of the gospel. And verse 42 states, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now that's very important. First of all, stress is laid on the preaching of the Word of God. We will never grow unless we are hearing the Word of God preached, taught, explained. And we will never grow 
unless we are dedicated to reading the scriptures ourselves weekly, daily. Well, this first church was devoted to that, as Luke writes, devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, that's the first thing that characterized the early church. Devotion to the Word of God. I suppose I should emphasize that word, devotion, devoting themselves. But that speaks quite clearly, I think. These people were devoted to the teaching of the apostles, but also to fellowship. They shared a common life together and formed a community. But Luke meant something more specific than that when he speaks of fellowship. The last two statements of the verse actually define what he meant by it. It is the breaking of bread and prayer. The word and is not there. It's not found between fellowship and the breaking of bread. It is simply fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. And those two words, those two statements, fellowship and prayer, define what Luke meant by fellowship. Breaking of bread is a reference to taking the Lord's Supper. And we know that from Luke chapter 22, verse 19, where the same expression is used of the Lord instituting the Lord's Supper. He broke bread. It says he took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples. Observing the Lord's Supper was a regular part of the meeting of the church. The early church was as devoted to it as it was to the teaching of the apostles and to prayer. And in those very early days, they took the Lord's Supper often because they met often. The, the chapter ends on verses 46 and 47. They met day by day in the temple. Now, they were truly committed to the faith. The Lord was their first love. But they also met in smaller groups, we read, breaking bread from house to house, observing the Lord's Supper together in smaller groups and, and also sharing a meal together. Now that was the first church, the church of Jerusalem. But the gospel spread from Jerusalem out to Samaria and then across the west throughout the Gentile world. And as it spread increasingly to the Gentiles and became an increasingly Gentile church, uh, some things did change. At, Paul, at the end of Paul's third missionary journey in Acts chapter 20, we notice some of these changes. But we can also see that some things stayed the same. Paul was on his way to Jerusalem when he passed through Macedonia. From Philippi, he sailed across the Aegean to Troas on the northwest coast of Turkey where he stayed for a week. Luke wrote in verse 7, On the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Now that was a change from meeting every, meeting every day in the temple to one day a week in a house. Uh, that was the location of the meetings of the early church. In Romans 16, for example, Paul sent greetings to Prisca and Aquila, or to Priscilla and Aquila, and the church that met in their house. There are other statements like that in the letters of the Apostle Paul. And they were meeting, you'll notice, on the first day of the week, Sunday, not Saturday. So the church was no longer observing the Sabbath, which was a major change from the synagogue. From an early date, the, the church met regularly on Sunday, which was the, the day, as you know, Christ was resurrected from the dead. So Sunday became the Lord's Day. The fact that early Christians, many of whom were Jewish, would make such a change, and it was a drastic change, has been seen as added proof of the resurrection. 
It would take something as significant as the resurrection to cause such a change, that of moving the day of worship from the last day of the week as the law prescribed to the first day. That's the significance of Sunday worship. Every Sunday we meet as a celebration of Christ's resurrection from the dead, and in doing so, we proclaim our faith in a living Savior. They met at night. That is likely due to the, the social makeup of the church. Many early Christians were slaves. Their time was not their own. They had to work in, in the day and were not able to meet until night. What is important about verse 7 is it gives us a glimpse into the meeting of the early church and, and in so doing gives us a model of how the church is to function, what the, the basic aspects of the church are for it to function well. I, I don't think meeting in houses is necessary or Meeting at night is necessary. What is necessary is teaching and observing the Lord's Supper as well as baptism when that is necessary. We see that back in Acts chapter 2. There are two ordinances of the church. Two, if I can put it this way, I don't like this, to use this word necessarily, but ceremonies that the church observes. And that is the Lord's Supper and baptism. And we see that here in chapter 20. The church is gathered on the first day of the week to break bread, to take the Lord's Supper. It was part of the, the regular weekly meeting of the church, and, and it was an essential part. It was done in obedience to the instruction that the Lord gave in Luke chapter 22, verse 17. He said, do this in remembrance of me. That is the reason that we observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Usually on Sunday evening, at least historically it's been that way until recently, the time is not so important as the frequency. Every Sunday. Now that was clearly the practice as seen in the meetings of the church in both Acts chapter 2 and Acts 20. That stayed the same over the years because the Lord commanded it. Commanded it. But also for very practical reasons. In fact, He commanded it for very practical reasons. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of Me. The word remember... It's a very important word in the Old Testament, as is the word forget. Forgetting led to disobedience and ruin. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23, Moses warned, Watch yourself that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God and make for yourself a graven image. Deuteronomy 8, verse 19 I sh it shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today that you will surely perish. And I can give numerous examples of that throughout Deuteronomy, throughout the Old Testament, of the danger of forgetting. It is a dangerous thing. And so repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, Israel was told to remember it is the antidote to forgetting and to spiritual drift and ruin, and it's the means for being strengthened and to being built up in one's faith. In Deuteronomy 15, verse 15, Moses said, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That was the purpose of Passover, that they remember that they keep this great redemption they had experienced in, ever in their mind, what the Lord God had done for them, lest they forget and fall. So it's no coincidence that on the night of Passover, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper with the command, do this in remembrance of me. Remember that I redeemed you from slavery and the very worst kind of slavery, slavery to sin and death. 
And so in obedience to the Lord, the early church practiced that every week, lest they forget. That's our practice. And we're not alone in our understanding of this. John Calvin ab advocated it in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. He wrote that the Lord's Supper should be administered at least once a week. The great Baptist, Charles Spurgeon, said, Shame on the Christian church that she should put off to once a month the Lord's Supper. Well, most churches probably put it off to four times a year. And he spoke of the sweetness of doing it every week. It is of great practical value. As we meditate on Christ, we remember His sacrifice for us. That cultivates gratitude in us, love for Him, which is really the impetus or incentive for action and obedience. Now, we're commanded to do certain things, and we really have no option but to do what we're commanded to do. But the right way to do what the Lord would have us to do is out of gratitude and love, and this is what instills that. It also gives us an opportunity to express our faith in Him and to show our devotion to Him. So to that end, we observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday and preach the Word. That's, again, equally important as we have seen, but it's mentioned next. Luke wrote that Paul began talking to them and he prolonged his message until midnight. One of the last statements that Paul made was his command in 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verse 2. This is a man who's facing death. He's in chains and he knows the end is very close. And so he's saying what's really on his heart and what Timothy needs to hear and what the church needs to hear. And he said, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. As God said in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. And so Paul preached, and he preached until midnight. It was evening, assuming the meeting began around 7 at night. It went on until 12 o'clock. That was a message of four or five hours. Well, that had to be unusual, but... This was Paul. This was the apostle. It was a rare opportunity, and so they wanted to hear him. At least most did. One man fell asleep. Well, like I said, some things have changed and some things have stayed the same. And <laughs> that's uh, always an encouragement for a preacher to come to this because when one looks out and sees that happening, so well, this is apostolic. <laughs> so. He was a young man named Eutychus, and I, I will confess that in my young life I was a Eutychus, but uh, Luke said he was a boy. That's the ver how he describes him in verse 12, <clears throat> which normally covered the years of 8 to 14. Well, he's a young child. He's a boy. Maybe he wasn't all that interested in the lesson that Paul gave, at least not as interested as he ought to have been, but the circumstances are unusual here. Maybe he, he had worked hard that week and was tired. It was late, probably past his bedtime. They rose early in those days. But also, since it was night, Luke wrote in verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room. The flickering light may have had a kind of hypnotic effect on this young boy, Eutychus. Anyway, he fell out of the third story window and they picked him up dead. So Paul rushed down, embraced him, and he was revived. He was restored. It was a miracle. And that miracle allowed them to go back upstairs for more teaching. They valued the Word of God. And I think, in line with that, there may be more 
to the mention of the, the many lamps in the upper room than simply describing the setting of the evening. That there is symbolism in it that representing what the church was and what the church is to be. Troas was named after Troy. It was located on the site of that most famous battle of the ancient world where Achilles and Hector fought. But something of far greater importance occurred there in that small room that evening. It was full of lamps, lights shining in the night. That's the church. Those Christians listening to Paul were being equipped to shine out in, in the darkness of this world with the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. But what will make us able to do that is fellowship in the things that we see here, as Luke describes it. Fellowship, which involves taking the Lord's Supper, which involves baptism at times, which involves the ministry, the instruction of the Word of God, doing all of this in obedience to what the Lord has been teaching, what He teaches here, what the apostles instruct us to do. Now, we know other things occurred in the meeting of the early church. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, Paul wrote of speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I think in that passage, the context uh, that Paul is addressing is the meeting of the church. So the meeting would uh, usually, it seems, end with a hymn. And I say that because that's how the Passover celebration ended when the Lord established the Lord's Supper, we're told that when it ended, they sang a hymn. So the early church was a singing church, as were the churches of the Reformation. In fact, when there is revival, as with the Great Awakening in the, 19th, or the 18th century, hymns were written. Think of the, the hymns written by Charles and John Wesley. And singing occurs. It's natural. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, gives us another glimpse into the meeting of the church and how it was conducted. And it was clearly a very active service. Paul wrote, What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. The Princeton theologian and Presbyterian Charles Hodge wrote in his commentary, this passage and indeed the whole chapter presents a lively image of an early Christian assembly. It was lively. More recent commentator Don Carson wrote, it is clear that the Corinthian service was not boring. And that is clearly intended as an understatement. And not just the, the Corinthian service, but church services all around the Mediterranean and throughout the, Mediterranean and throughout the uh, ancient world. Th this was a typical meeting of the church. It was made up of all kinds of people, men and women, slaves and free men, rich and poor, all kinds of people. They gathered in someone's home on a Sunday evening where they would take the Lord's Supper, baptize new converts, and, and minister to one another using their spiritual gifts. It was patterned after the synagogue service in the first century. And in the synagogue, there was no single, as it were, pastor. Those meetings were overseen by a, a leader of the synagogue, but he would often choose someone to speak. And you see this in the Gospels. When Jesus returned to Nazareth, he was asked to speak in this synagogue that he'd grown up in. And he speaks, opens up Isaiah, and, and does exposition from it. You see it all through the book of Acts. Paul would enter the synagogues in whatever city he went, and he would give the gospel. In fact, that situation of the synagogue where various people were able to speak was very instrumental 
in facilitating the spread of the gospel throughout the ancient world as the apostles moved from city to city. Well, in the church, there were elders to oversee the meeting, but it was open to various men to teach and use their gifts. And so we've often referred to the evening meeting as the open meeting. Everyone came prepared. Each one, Paul says, has a song, has a teaching, has a revelation. And that means that, that someone composed a New Testament psalm to be sung in the meeting. Someone else prepared a lesson to teach, a, a passage from the Bible, and so on. It operated on the principle of the priesthood of all believers. That's one of the great doctrines of the New Testament the priesthood of all believers. We all have a responsibility to one another and before the Lord, and we go directly to Him. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he calls us a royal priesthood. So when Paul wrote, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, he means every person is a priest and has a ministry, a ministry to one another. And we are to minister to one another according to our gift, under the guidance and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we attempt to do when we follow this same format or plan on what was Sunday evening and will be now on Sunday morning beginning next week. Uh, this is not what people are used to when they go to church. They're used to a passive service where they sit, they listen, and they leave. Now that's different from what Paul describes here. Somehow the church got away from, from this form of worship. Charles Hodge suggested that the, the freedom and spontaneity of the early church ended when the miraculous gifts of prophecy and tongues ceased. And I'm sure it, it did changed the meeting significantly when those gifts ceased. But the gift of teaching didn't stop. The need for prayer didn't end. And that format allowed for different gifted teachers to speak and for people to pray and to request hymns. And I imagine different men stood and spoke, as Paul did in Troas, not, not for as long as he spoke, but long enough certainly to give a good exposition from a book of the Bible. And I assume that they studied through books as we do, but uh, not just one individual. Others contributed. And perhaps others would stand after the instruction was given and, and would add something to the instruction that the teacher had just given. Um, the difficulty with this kind of meeting is that it requires maturity to work. It requires that people are de devoted to doing these very things. It, so it requires preparation from everyone. Preparation if one's going to speak, but certainly preparation of prayer for a spiritual preparation and vigilance in that. It doesn't rely on, on just a few trained men to carry it. And that can seem a little dangerous to people. A kind, this kind of freedom seems to invite anarchy. And it can. Hodge called the meeting lively. It could become disorderly. Evidently, it, it became a little too lively in Corinth because Paul corrected the church in this passage. In fact, he's giving correction throughout this portion of 1 Corinthians on the meeting of the church. He said in verse 33, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So things are to be conducted in an orderly manner. In order to do that, as I, I said, it requires that people come prepared, spiritually prepared, prepared in every way. 
Generally, it, it is people who are gifted to speak who should stand and speak and teach. But sometimes people who don't have that gift have a burden, as it were, have something that they feel they ought to say, a word of praise for something that God has done in their life, or a word of thanksgiving to offer to the Lord, or simply, as I said, to stand and request a hymn or to give a prayer. The standard for those who speak is, very simply, orthodoxy, doctrinal purity. Paul ended the chapter in verse 40 by stating, all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. And he wrote at the end of verse 26, let all things be done for edification, to build up the body. That's the goal of what's done. When things aren't, are not orderly or edifying, and occasionally they aren't, an elder must give correction. That's why elders watch over the meeting. Well, we won't be going to midnight, meaning we won't be going a great length of time in that service. We, we have to consider children in the nursery, and uh, it, it will have been a long morning. So the meeting will last about 45 minutes and conclude with the observance of the Lord's Supper. Now that means that uh, those who do speak need to be disciplined in speaking. They need to discipline themselves to be concise. How long is concise? I can't really say, but I would suggest five to ten minutes. That's a fair length of time to speak. What much of the instruction given is designed to do at that point in the service is prepare us for taking the Lord's Supper. So much of what is said should have that as its objective, speaking of Christ and His sacrifice for us. It's for believer priests. So it's a meeting open to a variety of men. And as I say, men, because... Paul is clear in verse 34, only men are to teach in the meeting of the church. And instruction is to be given in English, not in the tongues of angels, if you understand my meaning in that. Some of you may find uh, the meeting different. I think you will. With various people speaking and periods of silence before and after people speak, Sometimes long periods of silence. People often find that uncomfortable, but those are really opportunities to reflect, to opportunities to meditate on, on what has been said, on what we are about to do in taking the Lord's Supper, which is remember Christ. One of our elders, Jim Frazier, often reminds us that the Lord has asked us to do this, to Remember Him by taking the Lord's Supper. As we see from the book of Galatians, we're no longer under the law. Paul makes that point in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 2. We no longer have the 613 commandments as, as the yoke upon us. We're free from the law, but that doesn't mean we're free not to, to do whatever we like. The Lord has given us instruction, and He's expressed His mind and His desire for us, and He desires that we take the Lord's Supper regularly. It's very important, and it pleases Him that we do it. And that being true, it is certain to be a blessing to us spiritually and for our growth when we're obedient to Him. At the end of Acts chapter 2, Luke wrote, And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Building the church is God's business. But we're to be faithful to the principles that He set forth. When we are, the local church, this church, will grow and will develop according to to the way the Lord has desired us to grow, according to the pattern that He intends for us. We will be a vital assembly, a, a living, active assembly with the, the Spirit of God within us, 
and it will transform us. We'll be a loving assembly and a light in the neighborhood. Well, Charles Spurgeon called the gospel, the work of the gospel, the grandest of God's works. It brings people into the church, which he's presently building. And that too, that is his grandest work. In order to be a part of that great work, one must believe in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for sinners. All who trust in him for salvation are saved and made useful for his service, which has eternal reward. So if you've not believed in Christ, come to him. Trust in him and be saved. And then join us this next week around the Lord's table. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together to take a break from our studies in Galatians to study this specific subject of the church, which is so important to you. Your son gave himself up for the church. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the salvation we have in him. And now as we move to this last aspect of our service this morning and we remember him and through the Lord's Supper, we pray that you bless us. Prepare our hearts and may we reflect deeply upon all that this signifies. We thank you for your grace because that is what it is about. Your love for those who are enemies of yours and your redemption of us. We thank you for all that Christ has done for us. We thank you for the triune God's love and care for us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to observe the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like to read a portion of the Apostle John's account of the crucifixion of Jesus. It's in his 19th chapter, John chapter 19. Uh, John gives a rather lengthy recording of the event, but I'm only going to read a few verses, uh, beginning in verse 1 of John 19. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him, and they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. And then skipping down to verse 16. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. And the entire experience of Jesus' crucifixion ends in John's 30th verse. Jesus said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Crucifixion was an excruciating experience to endure. Uh, so was a Roman scourging. So was being forced to wear a crown of thorns. It was painful physically and also humiliating. And those who hated Jesus or just ignorantly abused him heaped scorn upon him throughout. That is the context in which most people uh, ponder the crucifixion of our Lord, that it was a, a, terrible, a terribly awful way to die. And the Lord's Supper, which, remember, Jesus himself inaugurated, portrays the ignominy and terrible pain he endured in going to the cross. That is part of what he meant, surely, 
when he said of the bread, take, eat, this is my body given to you, for you. And again, when he took the cup of wine and said, this is the cup of the new cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. His experience on the cross fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament that spoke of a suffering servant who was pierced through and crushed and who poured out himself to death and who spoke of his bones being out of joint and his tongue cleaving to his jaws and of the piercing of his hands and of his feet. But those physical agonies were not the worst sacrifices our Lord made. Uh, the voluntary assumption of the role of our sin bearer was his greatest sacrifice. The prophet spoke of that too. When our sins were laid upon him, Jesus cried out at God's judgment against him. My God, he cried, why have you forsaken me? Isaiah spoke of him bearing our iniquities in order to justify us and, and bearing the sins of many. Uh, the Lord caused the iniquity of us all to fall on, on him. After initially not understanding how Jesus could go to the cross in this manner, the apostles eventually understood the wonderful love of a Savior who would offer to endure such an experience in order to purchase the salvation of all those his Father gave to him. And Paul perhaps said it best when in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 in an appeal to his friends in Corinth to be reconciled to God, he wrote, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, he became our sin bearer so that we might bear his righteousness. Now we celebrate uh, how he uh, separated himself from the eternal peace and relationship that he had with his father from eternity past as he took our sin upon him. And if you're here this morning and you can say in your heart and in your mind that yes, uh, he took my sin upon him and it was my sin that caused the father to turn away from him and leave him to bear the full penalty for sin, then we invite you to participate with us now with great joy in our hearts and thanksgiving for what he accomplished for us. Now, let me give thanks for the bread. Father, thank you for this bread. Thank you for what it represents. You told us, you told your disciples, this is my body given for you. And we take it now, remembering the sacrifice you made, the love you showed in it. In Jesus' name, amen. In John 12, <clears throat> Jesus spoke uh, of judgment. Judgment on the world, judgment on the devil. <clears throat> but in verse 32, it would also be a moment of salvation. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. In verse 33, John explains that he was speaking of the kind of death that he would die, he was speaking of the crucifixion, which at the time appeared to be an utter defeat. It was actually a total victory. It was by being lifted up from the earth on the cross, then by the resurrection and ascension up from the earth to heaven and to the throne that he gained salvation for his elect. On the basis of that complete sacrifice, remember, as Mark just read, he ends by saying, it is finished. Nothing more need be done. 
So on the basis of that complete sacrifice for all the sins of all for whom he died, all kinds of people, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, all kinds of people, he will, on the basis of that work, draw all of them to himself, safe from judgment, because he suffered their judgment in their place. Now that's the power of the cross. The instrument of death became the instrument of life for every believer in Jesus Christ. And that's what we remember as we take this cup. So let's give thanks for, the, for Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice for us that's symbolized in the cup of wine. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for that complete sacrifice that Your Son made for us, that for which You sent Him into the world to accomplish on our behalf while we were Your enemies. You saved us. We give You praise and thanks for all that He's done for us. In Christ's name, Amen. Let's conclude with a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In Christ's name, Amen. Look forward to seeing you next week at 9.30. Until then, keep your eyes fixed on Christ, the author and professor.